Today we will be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of ground of truth and without controversy great is the mystery of godliness god was manifest manifested in the flesh justified by in the spirit seen by angels preached among the gentiles believed on in the world received up in glory good morning everyone Certainly good to be with you this morning. And the uh, topic of today's lesson I got from actually my pew last week. I was sitting there and I looked. It's been in there a couple of weeks. I'm not sure where it came from. But there's this Bible been, been there and I looked at it and it said, placed by the Gideons. I, I don't think Gideons put that Bible in that pew there, but I'm not sure how it got there. But, you know, I started just reading through the introduction there a little bit and thought, you know, I really don't know much about Gideons. And so that, you'll see it moved uh, uh, from there in terms of the idea of the sermon, but the basis and premise of the idea came from this Gideons, the Gideon International. And we'll, we'll talk about them here in a little bit, but um, really want to talk about the church and what the role of the church is. And as, as the verses there suggest, it is the pillar and the ground of the truth. And we're going to notice some things about that. When you think about a pillar and this idea of being the pillar and ground of the truth, um, a lot of ideas, the foundation or pillar is that on which a building is built. It's the first layer and provides stable base for superstructure and bedrocks. So and this idea of foundation columns, it's kind of what supports the, the structure. And so the, the fundamental point that's being made here is the church. The church of the living God is the pillar and ground of the truth. And we're going to notice some thoughts from there. And if you were in Bible class, you would have heard a few things that, that we talked about related to that. So we're going to notice some things about being the pillar and ground of the truth. The first point I want to talk about is as a, or the responsibility there is to uphold the truth. Fundamentally, that's one of the major points here is it's our job and it's God's job for the church to be to, uh, and to do to uphold the truth. That's what we need to be doing. It's a major church responsibility. Hebrews 13 and 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls and those who much give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. And, and being one of the elders, that's one of the major responsibilities. We think about encouraging one another, but one of the other important parts and part of that is to Watch over people's souls and make sure that they're following what is truthful. Um, there's another idea here that I liked really well found in Ezekiel chapter 22. It says, the Lord says, I look for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. That's actually a very good um, point for a lesson one of these days. I'll probably spend more time on it. This idea, you know, a fortress and a castle, when you think about that, um, it's it's to protect, right? You got the inhabitants inside this castle and this castle is built to protect those from the inside. And just like those walls, those strong, tall walls to keep those foreign invaders out, um, so are soldiers and watchmen that stand on the top of the wall. The church needs to have those watchmen. They need somebody to step in a gap. And the idea here is that what the wall, when it gets compromised and, and foreign invaders can come through that gap, somebody stands there and keeps that from happening. It's obviously easy to point to the elder and say, that's their job. But I'm telling you, it's everyone's job to stand in that gap and stand for the truth. You're part of the church. And the church's responsibility is to uphold the truth. And so we need to stand in the gap. And member as members in the church, that's a responsibility we all need to have. And so when we think about, I don't know if you spent time on, on the website, by the way, just as a friendly advertisement, you can download Congregate onto your phone. And especially for you men out there, it is fantastic. It'll tell you everything you're on for. Uh, it's really nice. They did a really nice job on that. So if you've got a, a smartphone, 
uh, I encourage you to do that. But, you know, one of the responsibilities, and this is actually a snap picture from off our website, is we need to uphold the truth. John 8 and 32 there says, and then 31 says, and Jesus said uh, to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And so the idea there is that um, we need to make sure that the truth is being taught and uphold the truth. And one of those is, is, is comes from this pulpit. If anybody speaks something that's not, not truthful and contrary, we have responsibility to make sure that the truth is being taught. So this is one way that we proclaim to the world, proclaim to those uh, out there that uh, what the truth is and also what's taught in classes. We have a responsibility to make sure that what's taught in classes is truthful and isn't teaching something contrary uh, to the gospel. Even what we discuss among our own selves, it's important that we speak the truth and uphold the truth. And then obviously that correlates down to what's taught in your homes and to your children. And so it's so important. We think about this idea of, uh, of upholding the truth as a church, being the pillar and ground of the truth. It's so important that we stand in truth and that it's taught in every aspect of our lives. Another thing that church, we need to defend the truth. So this idea of upholding and, and, and making sure inside that we're, we're teaching the truth, we also got to defend the truth from others from the outside. Um, when we are under attack, when just like a fort's being attacked, we need to defend. Everybody needs to, to, to fight and defend it. You know, I, I, taught, I, did, I did a lesson a while back about extremism and how many, many times we're viewed as being extreme in our views that we support extreme doctrines and practices and hold extreme opinions because we don't have instruments. We don't have women preachers. We don't, um, no kitchens. I mean, uh, we're anti sometimes another word maybe, but you know, it's important that we teach the truth. The truth is important. It's not obviously love is important, but so is upholding the truth. And it's so sad sometimes when we convince ourselves and try to talk ourselves in that we're being extreme. We need to be more open. No, we need to do what's right. We need to do what is truthful and what God actually accepts. And uh, the avoidance of extremism is advantageous to Christ's cause. Somehow we try to convince ourselves that if we're, if we're not extreme, it's going to help the cause of Christ. But it's not. As we, as we study, it's important that we stand for the truth and follow. That God demands to be taken seriously. Look in the old, old law. Look at the flood. Look at the plagues of Egypt. Look at Jericho. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Even the angels in heaven, right, that rejected God were, were cast down. And so we need to recognize that sin is a serious thing and not something to be taken lightly. We need to defend and stand for the truth. One of the reasons why we got to do that is for I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock, also among your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. No one is safe. Nobody in this side. I'm not safe. You're not safe. The devil's looking for weakness. And he preys on the weak. But he preys on all, anyone that he can get. And this could be anyone. Only one thing can protect us. And that is the armor of God. And so we've got to equip ourselves with the armor of God to defend the truth. As Ephesians, uh, writer there in chapter, uh, that, that's really hard to read. <laughs> chapter six, verses 10. It says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of, of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. And so we've got to put on this whole armor if we're going to resist the devil, that you may be able to withstand the devil in the evil day and having done all to stand. And so to fight the devil off, all of us, we've got to put this armor on. And so he says, therefore, having your loins grewed about uh, with truth. There we go. There's that word of truth. Uh, so important to us. Having known the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is living according to the way God would have us to live. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, 
wherein you be able to stay in the quench of the fiery darts to look. And our faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. And so our faith helps make us strong and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we all need to equip ourselves just like a soldier would equip himself to do battle because the devil is looking among us and saying, who can I attack? And so we've got to all protect ourselves. And finally, the, the bulk of the lesson I want to spend on is this other idea of propagating the truth, which is really like I, I got from this, uh, the idea of the Gideons. And so we're going to look at this idea of propagating the truth. And when we think about propagate, propagate, um, it means to foster growing knowledge of, familiarity with, or acceptance, such as an idea or belief. And so the idea is to push this idea out. And so we have responsibility to push the truth out into the world. And so how do we do that? How do we get people to accept the truth? And, to, and, um, and again, uh, one of the things I appreciate is, uh, you know, men go out and preach. This is one way we do it. We obviously talk about what's taught and taught here, but there, we have other, we have men going out and speaking to other congregations, speaking the truth. So that's another way that we propagate and, and teach the truth, not just here, but uh, in local congregations as well, other congregations. Romans 10, 13 through 15. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. You know, this is something we've been striving to get a preacher here. They're, they're not the men going out and preaching like there were uh, years ago. Less, less men are desiring uh, this is a profession. And so it is important when we have an opportunity and if, if you have ability that we go out and we preach and we teach. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believed and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And so we have a responsibility to go out and propagate and teach the truth, which gets us to the Gideons. Don't know how much you know about them. But um, we're going to take a look at the organization and look at what they're dedicated to. Um, they call themselves the Gideons. It's based on a story in the Old Testament, and I won't spoil it. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this story here in a little bit. But that's how they got their name. They got their name from Gideon in the Bible. And we'll notice um, why that is the case. This is right off their website, so I'm not stating anything. That's that's my own interpretation. Um. And again, the, the, the verse that they're rallying verse is Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Uh, get an international association of Christians, business and professional men, their wives dedicated to telling people about Jesus through the associating together for service, sharing personal testimony and providing Bibles and New Testaments. While we're often recognized for our work with hotels, we also place and distribute scriptures in strategic locations so they are available to those who want them, as well as to those who may not know they need them. That sounds, sounds pretty good, right? Changing the life for more than 100 years, the Gideon International began distributing the Word of God in 1908. Today, there are more than 269,500 Gideons and auxiliary and untold number of supporters in some 200 countries, the territories and possessions around the globe. These dedicated individuals have given their time and money to make it possible for others to learn about the love of God by giving them access to his word. We have placed and distributed more than 2 billion Bibles and New Testaments around the world. Remarkable, isn't it? You know, I was weird at, at, at uh, sale yesterday. I don't know if dad saw it. I saw one free item on a table. It said free on it. You know what it was? It was a Bible. Didn't look in very good shape, but <laughs> I don't think they were necessarily uh, pre saving that, giving that Bible to someone to spread the word. I just don't think they wanted it. It had free on it. But you can't argue with the mission, right? They're trying to get Bibles out there. That's actually a good thing. I mean, it's it, it's the Bible. It's an accurate version of the Bible. And you know what? If, if it stopped there, it probably might not, might not be a bad thing. But you go further, and if you look inside, the Bible will learn a little bit more about what they're teaching. It's again off their website. It says, um, know Jesus as your Savior. The Bible is the foundation for Christianity. It contains the answers to all of life's vital questions. 
and changes the very lens of the worldview through which we view reality. Most importantly, it teaches us how to have a true, meaningful relationship with God. Verses illustrate the plan of salvation. God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know what? That's true. God loves all, all men. So that is true. But God shows his love for us. And while we were not, still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and 8. That also is true. Christ died for us. All are sinners. For all have sinned and come and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. As is written, None is righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.10, and we talked about that in Bible class. Absolutely true. All of sin. We're all sinners. God's remedy for sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John 1 and 12. And so this is true as well. The salvation of sin, forgiveness of sin, comes through Jesus Christ. And it uh, once all to be saved. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I come to him and eat with him and he with me. Revelations 3.20. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10.13. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. John 20 and 31. Absolutely true. God wants all to be saved. Here's where the train goes off the track. So far, everything they've said is absolutely 100% true, and I believe the Bible teaches it. Pray. As a Christian, you can talk to God through prayer and share your heart with him, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey. He is faithfully listening for you to call on him, to begin your new life in faith, prayer, and simple prayer. And notice, there's no passage listed for this paragraph. God, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm in need of salvation. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose again to bring me a new life. I ask you to receive, I ask to receive your forgiveness and grace and choose to follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. That's a predominant view in the world today, that that's all that's needed. It's just pray the sinner's prayer and you'll be saved. And you know what? There's a lot of truth to what I just read. And I, I can amen every single thing, but there's, and we won't bother the last two paragraphs, there's a big thing missing here. And, and the one thing I want to warn you about is what we, we talked about there. Grievous wolves will enter among you, not sparing the flock. Also your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things. And so we got to be careful that you don't mix a lot of truth in there. And then you teach something that the Bible doesn't teach. And I ask you, what's missing? Where did they miss it? Water baptism, not one word said about water baptism. And yet you, you look into your New Testaments and there it's full of verses about water baptism. Now, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open, the Holy Spirit descended on bodily form like a dove and a voice from heaven saying, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whosoever does not believe will be condemned. You can't just take that baptized out of there and say, all you got to do is believe. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Acts 2, 41. So those who received the word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, there is one body, one spirit, just as you're called and one hope you're calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all is over all, through all, and in you all. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. I'm not sure why that last word um, is a different color there, but point where I'm, I'm saying is that water baptism is an important step. It's not just believing in God and praying to God. And so there's parts of what they teach I applaud. And I won't read all these verses for sake of time this morning, but there are many other verses in the Bible that talk about water baptism. You just can't take what you want and, 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 and ignore these other passages. And so it's important. point I'm making is, is that I applaud what they're doing in terms of getting the word out. People read the Bible. 
But what is not truthful, and uh, and I won't bother, I didn't put pages in here, is that what I just read to you is actually all written in the front of this book before you get to the Bible part. This idea of praying to God and be saved, that's that's the problem I have with what's being taught there. Plus, it's not an organization's job to be the pillar and ground of the truth, right? And so this is a real lesson for us today. It's easy to point fingers at, at, at these folks. Um, before we do that and talk a little bit more about that, let's just notice some things about the story of Gideon because I think there's a good lesson for us here um, when, it talks, when we talk about Gideon. When Gideon hears he will be saved, the Israelite, uh, save the Israelite peace, people from his oppressors, he does really believe it. He doesn't really believe it at first. So he, he's told he's going to save his people, but he doesn't really believe it at first. So he tests God. And Gideon tests God um, right off the bat. It seems to co contradict the, the commandments of God there in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Um, and Gideon seems to do this a lot. And he uses the fleece there and... and and we won't go into the details, super detailed today, but we, we know the idea here that Gideon was going to save his people. But he didn't really believe it. And so he asked God to do some things to prove to him using a fleece. Um, and he wanted assurance from God that, that God was with him. Um, it says, and, and uh, Gideon and his men then traveled near the camp of Midian and prepare for battle. The idea there was you may remember that, that he had raised up like 30,000 men to fight against the Midianites. Still wasn't, wasn't as many men as the Midianites, but at least it gave him some confidence. We got a chance to win. And God wanted to prove something to Gideon, so he went out and said, no, that's too many men. And ultimately, we know the story where they had the men drank from the water and those that lapped, and there were about 300 men, right, that he went to battle. And, of course, he was victorious. And so the idea and lesson from there God is willing to help increase our faith if we open our eyes. So there is a valuable lesson here from Gideon. God, God will show us and God will, will, can, uh, will show us his power if we're willing to see it and look for it. We need to let God rule in our life and not men. Men will try to, to lead you astray. The devil will use men. And so we need to make sure that God rules in our heart and our minds and not men. And, and probably the most valuable lesson that I get from the Gideon story is that a few can turn and, and be, uh, can do so many things with God's help. We can do a lot. We may say we're just a small group. We can't do much. But you know what? We can do a lot with God's help. And I think that's probably the most valuable lesson that we can learn from the story of Gideon. And so I believe the Gideons are doing a good thing in distributing Bibles all over the world. I, I, Amen to that. Getting Bibles out over 2 billion, I mean, that's remarkable. But they're erring in teaching the truth about what's needed to be saved. And you know what? That's not to be unexpected. You know why? Because God didn't give an organization responsibility to be the pillar and gown of the truth. He gave that to the church. And that's why God gave that responsibility to the church. Is because God knew that the church that seeks after his will will teach the truth and not some perverted or twisted version of the truth, which is what's what we have in the world today, so many places. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth, not an organization. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. We need to be the light. We need to speak out and show folks the world what is true. And so how can we do that? Well, one way we can do that is we can tend studies led by others. There's classes that, that's had, and there's many ladies' classes, and, and there's Bible classes here. So one thing you can do to help in, in spreading the truth is support one another in doing that, right? If you just got a few people out there doing it, you're not, doing your, you're not holding up your end of the deal. You rely on other people to do the work. Have a study with someone. We can have it um, individually. In fact, we'll know some statistics about that. The most effective study we can have is one-on-one -on -one with someone. And so that's a way that you can be a light and a, and a pillar to the truth. Invite someone to services. When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you actually invited someone to come to services? Spend time with other Christians. So many times we want to spend time with people in the world. 
people that don't care anything about God's mission, don't care anything about what's what uh, in terms of you know, of heaven and and things of the truth that we need to be supporting. And then one of the more important things is stop pointing your finger at someone else. You rely, so many people rely on other people to do the work. I know it. I know I see it in the workplace. You know, um, one thing in my job is when you're kind of at the top of tops of the company, people, it all falls on you. And you want a lot of people let you fail. They don't care. Their neck's not out. In fact, some people take uh, joy in that and watching their bosses fail. And they'll just point a finger at them. It's their job. And it's sad, but I see this in the church as well. People just show up here. They're going to come. They don't care who's got the opening prayer, who's got songs, who's got, well, that's all filled out or whether some, a visitor's here and somebody's going to talk to that visitor. They just, they show up. And then when that, when I, the services are ever made, they just shoot out the door. That's their responsibility. Just somebody else do it. Point to someone else. Let someone else do it. Let me encourage you. Don't take that attitude. I talked about um, how you, how do you convert people? I, I talked about the Gideons not getting it right, but you know what? They're trying. They're trying. We need to be working. We need to try. There's a lot of things that we could be doing, and you may have ideas for how to do that. Um, ran across some statistics that 2% of all Christians are converted through media, literature, TV, radio. So about two out of 100 get converted through those means. 6% become believers through the influence of a particular preacher. So some people um, listen to a preacher and they become converted by what the preacher speaks. Some through an, an evan, uh, evangelistic outreach. That leaves about 86%. <laughs> you know how those 86% people are converted? One-on-one. -on -one. Isn't that amazing? The most effective thing we can do to convert others and bring them to the church is talking to individuals one-on-one. -on -one. But so we rely so much on the preaching, teaching, or getting the word out. But you can talk to people individually, and you need to be doing that. It's reported that only 5% of Christians in America have ever led another person to Jesus. Even more troublesome, pollsters, this George Barnes says, among Christians only feel 53% even feel a responsibility. Most Christians out there don't even feel like they're responsible to try to convert anyone else or bring anyone else to the gospel. And so, one, a couple of final thoughts here. Anybody watched Willy Wonka in a Chocolate Factory? Loved that show when I was a kid. The story is they sell these candy bars, right? He's selling these candy bars, and, and only a few number of these candy bars is a golden ticket. And if you got one of those golden tickets, you could go in and, and uh, tour the Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. I don't know if you remember that, but I, I, I definitely love the show. You're just going to play on that a little bit and say, what if, what if, what if God gave golden tickets out to only select few? And I want you just to follow me on this thought for a moment. You know, when you get on an airplane, they tell you the first thing you need to do is put your own mask on, right? Because if the cabin becomes depleted of oxygen, if you pass out, then you can't help the person beside you. And so imagine, in this case, um, we've got to, to work out our own salvation, right? And so I'm going to give you a free pass. You're on the list. My question to you, who else is going to be on the list? Who's on your list? Obviously, my wife and I, that would be number one, right? Hopefully, um, and it may not be, you may not be married. It might be someone else. Then there's our three children. So that's my top five. I hope I, I, hope I can save them all. I hope, we, hope, hope they're all saved. And then you go down a little further. I've got their wives now and two kids. That's 10. That's my 10. What if you only had 10 tickets? What if you were, just imagine, I almost passed out cards and let people fill these out. But I, sake of time, I thought it'd take too long. Just imagine you were given 10 tickets. That's it. 
who's on your who's on your list? You know, sometimes you send out wedding invitations. It's hard to get the list down to 100, 200. Imagine you only had 10. Who'd you give them to? The list gets long really quick. Mom and dad, my siblings. That's back there with Addie, but I put her on the list too because I knew she'd be here. I didn't include the uh, spouses of the siblings, but. And then you got nephews, you got grandkids. You know, what's amazing to me is how quickly in your own family, how many people there are. Just imagine if you only had so many you could save. And let me ask you, what are you doing about it? You know, as elders, this boat all got a lot bigger for me real quick. But now it's everybody in here, right? It's not just my children. But how do we save everyone? And that's our goal. And I'll tell you, it's a, it's a big responsibility. It's not easy. We worry about them. And we talk about individuals that we worry about. And so that's a huge responsibility. First John 15 and 13 there. Obviously, it uh, says, greater love hath no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And so it's easy, easy for me to give up my ticket, right? Because if I asked you, the other question I didn't ask you is what if you had, you could give your ticket to someone else? It'd be real easy, the Bible points out, to give that to somebody on this list. It'd be real easy for me to give that ticket to someone on this list. I love all these people. They're close to me. I don't want any of these people to, to, to lose their soul. It reminds me of another example. And I ask a question, what will you do? Not, who will you save? And so just bear with me as I read this story, because I think it fits very well with the point I'm trying to drive home right now. So once the Titanic was fully sunk, there was not complete silence, as you may have thought. No, there was screaming, praying, crying, and begging coming from the people in the below 30 degrees Fahrenheit water. It was actually 28 degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> close to that. Salt water freezes at 28 degrees. It was as cold as it could be without it being ice. If you can imagine how cold this water was. People in the water were in survival instinct mode and were willing to do anything to stay alive. This included using other living human beings as floating devices. Can you imagine that? You've never had been in a situation where you were just trying to survive and, and they were literally would push other people under to try to, to hold themselves above the water. But the people in the lifeboats could not for fear that they might be capsized. Oh, I skipped every part. So they were willing to hold a living person down the water in order to stay afloat. People were begging the passengers in the lifeboats to let them come in. Could you imagine seeing a lifeboat and just trying? And the water, the boat set up so high on the water, they couldn't reach up and pull themselves onto the boats. They were begging these people in these boats to, to, to let them come up. But the people in the lifeboats could not for fear that they may be capsized by the frightened people in the water pulling the boat upside down. People in the water were crying out of fear, loss, and complete horror. They were also praying. Some were praying for God to keep them alive until they were saved, while others were praying for God to let them die now because they were in so much pain. For 20 minutes straight, passengers in the lifeboats plugged their ears, or even sang loudly with the other people so that they could not hear the screaming and the crying. People were freezing to death right in front of them. People in lifeboats were crying, not only because of the loss of their loved ones, but also because they did not want to be there watching people die. Some people knew that their loved ones were one of the people in the water screaming for them. you imagine that? You're in a lifeboat and knowing that you've got loved ones in the water that are literally freezing to death in front of you and screaming for help. Other people in the lifeboats were literally slowly, slowly freezing to death, even people in the boat. It was, it was cold. There were a couple of people that wanted to go back and try to save the people. People in the boats wanted to go back. One of those people, you may have heard the name, the unsinkable Mary Brown. Didn't know much about her. She was on lifeboat number six. And the captain of that boat was a really mean seaman. And she threatened to throw him in 
if they didn't go back to get passengers and help them. When they went back, they found nine survivors. They pulled them all on board, but only six of the nine survived. 20 minutes after the Titanic sunk, the screaming stopped for good. Everyone was dead or too frozen to speak. It was truly the silence of death. How the 18 lifeboats, two lifeboats, only two went back to look for survivors. They found only nine people who were still alive. And as I mentioned, six of those people were saved. For almost two hours, the survivors waited for the Carpathia to arrive. Suddenly, they noticed distressed rockets off in the distance, and they were rescued. You know, it just fits so well to me, this idea of trying to save those that are lost. We have people out there screaming. There's people dying. I mean, spiritually. I'm not talking physically. Spiritually, people are dying. And we have the very things that will save them, and we keep it to ourselves. We're quiet. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. We need to speak the truth. Yeah, Molly got, Brown got her name, the unsinkable uh, Brown there, because she helped in the ship's evacuation, taking an oar herself in the lifeboat and urging the lifeboat crew to go back and save more passengers. That's how she got her name. Very valuable lesson for us and an attitude as members of the church we need to have. And that is people out in the world are lost and we have the truth. We have the saving power of God. And we need to give them a vision of a much greater place. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. And so that's what I've got for you this morning. There's so much. We think about um, good people are doing, but the most important thing we need to be as a church is the pillar and ground of the truth. We need to sound that call. We need to uh, drive that message home, not to just our immediate family, but to all out in the world. And so you may have ideas for things that we could be doing. Listen, we're all ears. As elders, I can tell you, we debate, we talk about what can we do to grow the church, to strengthen the church, get more people to come more often. Those are discussions we have. You know what? There is no... There's no magic formula that works for everyone. But you know what? If every one of us personally takes that responsibility, we can do so much more as a congregation. And so if you're not a, if you're an audience and never become a Christian, there's no better uh, place you can be as a Christian than in the church. Um, come join the, come join, get in the boat, get in the lifeboat. Because you know what? If you're lost, you're like the one out there sinking. You're going to drown. You're going to die. There's no hope. You've got to be baptized. You've got to join, uh, be part of the church. Repent of your sins. Confess you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and buried with him in baptism. And if you're in need of the prayers of the brethren here, if we can assist you in any way, please come while together we stand and while we sing.